um, I need to write before the rest of the world gets in my head and starts mucking up my thoughts. And so I am best at writing first thing in the morning. That is Shanna B. T. Ion, the author behind the Pipe Wrench magazine piece, If We Can Soar, What Birmingham Roller Pigeons Offer the Men of South Central. I'm Brendan O'Mara, and this is the Creative Nonfiction Podcast. Now in its ninth year somehow, this is the show where I speak to badass people about the art and craft of telling true stories. You know what time it is. Oh yes, Shanna and I get into some great stuff in this episode. I'm starting to play around with not asking guests to be as, let's say, prescriptive or advice-giving. And just talking to them about how they go about the work, taking deeper dives into the books or essays, and letting their brilliant insights do the heavy lifting. I I still like asking people about their routines and such, but I've been thinking a lot about, quote, advice, unquote, culture lately, and how fraught it is, and how I'm not entirely sure it actually serves the audience. Maybe I'll riff on this as part of the parting shot at the end of the show. I don't know if it'll make any sense, but whatever. You're still here. Thanks to West Virginia Wesleyan College, Lou Residency MFA in Creative Writing for the support. Now in its 10th year, this affordable program boasts a low student-to-faculty ratio and a strong sense of community. Recent CNF faculty include Randon Billings Noble, Jeremy Jones, and Sarah Einstein. There's also fiction and poetry tracks. Recent faculty include Ashley Bryant Phillips and Jacinta Townsend, as well as Diane Gilliam and Savannah Sipple. No matter your discipline, if you're looking to up your craft or learn a new one, consider West Virginia Wesleyan right in the heart of Appalachia. Visit mfa.wvwc.edu for more information and dates of enrollment. Support for this podcast is also brought to you by Hippocamp 2021. It starts today, August 13th. Maybe... You can roll up and knock on the door and still get in. If you use the promo code CNFPOD21 at checkout, you'll get 50 bucks off. It's a great time. By the time you hear this, I will be at Hippocamp. Hope to see you there. Yes, Shanna is a writer, speaker, and well-being expert. She holds a PhD in sociology and is known as the well-being doctor. As owner of Wellbeing Works, LLC, her work has appeared in Long Reads and Pipe Wrench Magazine, among other places. She has spoken on the TEDx stage, and you'll find links to this stuff and embeds and the show notes at brendanomero.com. <laughs> She's training for a half marathon, a half, tri- a half Ironman triathlon, which has a half marathon component to it. Uh, she is a suburban homesteader, and that Instagram is black underscore suburban underscore homestead pretty cool stuff and as always you can keep the conversation going on twitter at cnf pod or at brendan o'mara uh, the at cnf pod instagram is still in the underage court of appeals i don't know how i'm gonna break that out of there i i appeal i, I appeal i appeal and nothing happens so it could be dead uh show notes of course are at brendan o'mara.com and you can subscribe to my up to 11 monthly newsletter for book recommendations, links to cool articles I come across, blog posts, writing prompts, sometimes a CNF and happy hour. I've tabled that for a little bit just because things are crazy. And in any case, it's a nice little respite. It's a little refuge of fun stuff that you get on the first of the month. No spam. Can't beat it. You might also want to consider becoming a CNF and member at the Patreon community. You get transcripts, audio magazine for sure, coaching. It's all there. So shop around. See what tier might work best for you. All those dollars that come in get funneled into the show to make a better product. The show's free, but it sure as hell ain't cheap. And that money also goes to pay writers for their work. Patreon.com slash CNFpod. All right. Enough with all that. Why don't we just get on... Get on to this podcast. Get on to this conversation. Here is Shanna B. Tion. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, so are are you based in D.C.? Yeah, the D.C. metro area, but the Maryland side. So, the Silver Spring, Maryland. Oh, very nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I believe that's where what uh, you know, Katie Ledecky, the great swimmer, hails from. Yeah, I, like I'm a right. newish swimmer, and because I want to, I want to compete in an Ironman, a, a half nice. Ironman, and so I just started swimming as an adult, and I. And right after Katie, I think won the 1500 meters. I said, "Well, since Katie just won, it only makes sense to post my my recent trip to the pool." You know, she's from the DC metro area. I'm from the DC metro area. She's an Olympian. I think you get the picture. <laughs> <laughs> People are like, "No way, Shannon, are you any Katie Ledecky?" But absolutely, she's from Bethesda, Maryland. Okay. Mm-hmm. In uh. Well, speaking of Ironman and triathlons, I, I did an Ironman uh, tw- almost 20 years ago. Nice. And, um, and it was one of those things like I couldn't swim worth a lick. Right. And I couldn't swim 50 yards without being gassed. So like, you know, fortunately, I was at sort of like young, stupid and athletic enough to do the other two without a whole lot of attention. But like swimming was yeah. the thing I needed to work on. So what's that been like for you to to take on this kind of swimming as an adult? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I I um was raised by a mother who was scared of the water and she never, you know, really prioritized swim lessons. We have done so with our kids, but I was never really proficient. And so it it, it, it takes some courage. You got to get over yourself because here you are, this grown woman who doesn't know what to do in the water to keep herself from sinking very well. And so I had to sort of humble myself a little bit. But once Once I did, you know, it was great. I like, I'm a forever learner, so I like learning new things. And this was definitely something to learn. I like doing hard things. And so it was definitely hard, but probably about eight weeks in, I could say that I was pretty, you know, I could swim. Now, how far I could swim, that's what I'm working on now, the endurance piece. But it was, it was good. I I was, I was proud of myself for setting the goal and actually moving through the steps to achieve it. And so it, it was very gratifying. Are you taking lessons through, like, say, the total immersion swimming program, if, if that makes any sense? Right, or... yeah, yeah. So I have a total immersion coach private lesson. You know, I needed oh, amazing. to, yeah. my time is so limited. I just needed to be about me for that hour that we're in the pool. And so I, I would go once a week. And every now and then we would have gaps where he would travel because he's a triathlete too. And so he would travel for different events. And so it would give me more time to practice, but he would teach me in lessons and I would go and practice on my own in the interim and then come back and we work on what I was having issues with. And so it, it was really efficient that way because I, the whole hour was just working on helping me to, to, to be able to, to be proficient. Yeah, it's all about trying to be one and uh, be comfortable in the water. And it, uh, those drills, those early drills can feel really goofy mm-hmm. or early on, like the mm-hmm. Superman glide. I don't know if that's what you've yep. uh, done at all, where you just kind of like have to bob there and lean on your lungs and everything. Right. It just feels really weird. And you feel like everybody's watching right, you. Right, totally. But, <laughs> but it's one of those things. It's like, well, this is how you sort of become, become one with the water, if you will. And over time, it's like, oh, wow, you start to yeah. really glide like a fish. Totally. And like, I'm there, you know, doing these basic drills. And then here comes this like five-year-old just went on down the lane. I'm like, oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, take me now, Lord. But <laughs> oh, that's great. I, I made it through. My ego made it through. A somewhat bruised, but it also made it to the other side as well. Well, that it, that gets to a point of what you what you already said that you love to challenge yourself and try hard things. And uh, some people, you know, they they tend to get into the the well worn grooves of their lives because mm-hmm. it's easy. You don't have to think about it. You can put those things on autopilot. Yeah. And yeah, there's value in that. But you know, where does that come from for you? Where you know you want to get out of those grooves and challenge yourself? I don't know. You know, I. I do think that certain people are sort of hardwired and and are just born a certain way. And I've noticed that a lot in in terms of being a parent, just seeing how different my kids are. And they just pop out the womb with these certain characteristics. And, you know, I think I maybe have always had a tendency to want to take the road less traveled and do hard things. Like I remember I was finishing up Peace Corps. I mean, I was finishing up high school and I know, finishing up high school. And by the time I finished high school, I knew that after college, I was going to go into the Peace Corps, you know? And so that wasn't anything that my peer group was talking about. And then certainly once I finished, 
university. I, I, I did the job market a little bit, but only because I wanted to be flown around and wine and dine, but I had no intention of taking <laughs> those jobs after graduating and I, but my friends were talking about, you know, these, you know, jobs, these great salaries. And I, I chose to do the Peace Corps. I wanted something different. I wanted to expand myself and and challenge myself. And it just sort of went on from there, ended up working internationally after the Peace Corps, wanted to stay abroad and um, ended up finding a job abroad and then continuing with that. Yeah. You know, then the PhD, then the business, I just keep trying to stretch the the boundaries of what's possible for me. And I just sort of always been that way. And I'm not sure how, because I didn't necessarily have role models of people doing that kind those kinds of things growing up. Yeah. The uh, many people can be hamstrung by, by fear to not be able to take that that leap to what, whether it be to pursue these advanced degrees or tra- travel abroad, work abroad, start a business. Mm-hmm. And it seems like you've, you know, look, just looking at your body of work that you've found a way to embrace that, that fear of that fear of doing the thing, taking the leap and the unknown. And uh, how, how have you come to grapple with that over the years? And it seems like it goes back decades really. Yeah. I don't know. I think earlier it was sort of like your thing, you know, I was just young enough and I had, nothing to lose. So I, I just do it. And the worst you could do is fail. And that's all right, too. And so it was a very different mm-hmm. sort of mindset of around things. I think as I've gotten older, and I do have more to lose. And I do have other people depending on me, what has kept me sort of um, propelling forward. I, I, I'm a long time meditator. So I meditate quite a bit and just sort of staying present and and, and truly believing that you know, the universe has my back and what I want to do wants me back. And so I just have to work for it to get it. It's already there. And so I, the mindset has, has really helped to propel me forward, even during hard times when it's not fun or glamorous or exciting. You know, that's the hard part about the arc of a goal. You know, you, you getting to the climax is, is, or to the, the, the sort of peak of it is great, but not always the road to it, but I've sort of relied on the belief that I can get to the top. And so that sort of propelled me forward. Yeah. The arc of a goal. I love, I love hearing you say that getting to a higher degree of altitude, whatever that is, however you define it yeah. in the middle between where you start and where you go, there's a whole lot of peaks and valleys, Absolutely. You know, but it's just on that path, right? Those valleys that you're experiencing in the messy middle are, st- are still higher than where you started, most mm-hmm. likely. Mm-hmm. Maybe they actually, maybe they might dip down below, but that's all part of the part of the growth. And you know, I, I always love talking to people on the show about, you know, you have that very experience when you're writing an essay or a, or a book or whatever, or a movie. And there are those messy middles, that grind of the work. And mm-hmm. when you're in those, in that phase of growth, like how have you learned to cultivate that, that, that grit that it takes to really grind through the middle of something? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. It's, it's always sort of the eye towards the, the outcome that you want. And, and I yeah. think, you know, keep in mind, which we talked about Iron Man, I've been reading a lot of books lately uh, of like these endurance athletes, um, Rich Roll, uh, um, uh, David Goggins, they have um, uh, sort of memoirs out and they all talk about this idea of if you want to do this kind of endurance athlete's work or space, you gotta, you gotta like, you gotta be okay with suffering and pain. I'm just like, oh gosh, that sounds awful, but... (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, when you think about it, any like great large goal, you got to be okay with the the hard parts and the grittiness and the the challenges. Right. And you almost kind of got to get a small high off of your capacity to push through those things with knowing that when you get to the other end, you know, you are going to have the thing that you want. And so I I think it's really similar. and, and, And perhaps that's what attracts me to endurance sports is that there is this this space where you just have to be okay with it sucking <laughs> and yeah. and even like it just a little bit enough to get you up to do it the next day again and again and and it sort of applies to to life as well as you know sports yeah i exactly like echoing echoing your point I, i've 
I, I don't run a whole lot, but when I do and when I ever I had, say, trained for a particular goal, and you always know that people tend to not like running hills or something. Mm-hmm. And I always think like, okay, well, there's a hill. I, if I learn to like the hill then that's just going to give me a more mental mindset to be like, uh, so many other people are going to hit this hill and be want to hang their head. And I'm going to mm-hmm. see that hill and, and just want to attack it. Same thing with the rain. A lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to run in the rain, but I love the rain. Uh, and so yes. that might mean that I get an extra workout and someone else does. Not that I'm necessarily in competition with anyone else other than myself, but it's right. just one of those things where, like you're saying, if you embrace that hard part and even learn to like it a little bit, mm-hmm. it just gives you that much more of an edge. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, um, David Goggins, he 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 says it's about staying hard. And he actually says, you yeah. know, when you have a a workout and it rains, what do you do? You know, you get your ass out there and run is what he says. <laughs> you know, you don't stay home. And so it's that sort of mentality that you push, you, what you want is what propels you forward. And so, yeah, totally. Now, I understand when you were you were younger, you were always writing plays, you know, short stories, even even essays or something. So uh, t- take me back to when you were, you know, growing up and, and just had a, a love of stories and a love of language. Yeah, I, I was always a little bit sort of, uh, you know, to myself. I loved books a lot. I have a, a friend now. We're good friends now. She was my neighbor and she used to joke how she would always come over and say, Hey, you want to come out and play? I said, no, I'm reading Charlotte's Web or something like that. And she was uh-huh. like, she thought that was the corniest, nerdiest thing ever. But um, <laughs> I've always taken value in this sort of internal world inside of my head. And so, but never thought of myself, never thought about myself as a writer or being a writer too seriously then. Um, it's just something I like to do. I think my mom recognized the interest. Oh no, she actually wasn't that. She brought me, this sort of tells you how old I am. She bought me a electronic word processor. <laughs> you was know, it a brother? She, yep, I well, think it bro- was. It was a brother. Oh my God, I had one, I got one of those in seventh grade when I was like 13, 14. Right, okay. and that was the, it was like a typewriter slash, yep. but it had a monitor exactly. too. Exactly. Yes. So it was an upgrade <laughs> from just a regular typewriter, right? Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, that's exactly what I had. And it had like a little cover case and you put the cover on and you could slide it under your bed or somewhere. But she brought me one of those. She thought she was getting me ready for college. She had no idea that that thing was going to be so obsolete. But <laughs> <laughs> but I used that to like write plays and poems and just, you know, different things in my head, but never took it too seriously. But I always knew that when I did write, it felt good. And so I, I did more of it. That's great. And sometimes along along that path, uh, you need people that are that recognize that light in you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be a you know, mentor or someone in high school or it could be a little bit later, too. Uh, maybe who recognized that 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 light, that little spark in young Shanna? I don't know. I don't know that anyone did. Like, I well, I would when I, I when I would I entered a writing contest one time of our Mother's Day a Mother's Day uh, contest at a local hotel and you got like a limousine ride and a brunch with your mom and I won that. And I was like, oh, you had to write a, a paragraph, something about your mom. And I would win things, but I don't know if I got recognized a lot uh, as a younger person for my writing. And then I went to college and I you know, did an engineering program and wasn't a lot of writing in that at all. I think it really is after college that my um, talents in writing started to maybe garner a little uh, recognition. And and then even uh, as of late, probably the last five or six years, even more so once I started to take myself seriously with it and decided I did want to carve out a space in the world where Shanna is a writer as well. Now, when it comes to the the writing and the practice of writing, you know, how what do you do to you know get into the right headset? So I, you know, when you're looking at that hill and you're going to run up that hill, like what what's the equivalent for you with the writing and how you're setting up that practice for yourself? Yeah, first thing in the morning, I'm an early riser, um, and sort of a remnant. I wasn't always that way, but sort of a remnant of writing my dissertation. It was the only time I had to myself, and so so I would get up early in the morning to to write and I 
realized I really liked it. The house was really quiet. There was no one who wanted to be up at that ungodly hour. And so it was all mine. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so um, I, the, to get in the headspace, what my most of my mornings look like typically is that I will wake up, I'll come to my office, I will meditate for a little while, I'll, I'll get something hot to drink, like um, uh, hot water and lemon or hot water and apple cider vinegar, apple cider vinegar, I will meditate, I will do some personal reading for about 30 minutes and then right into the writing immediately. Um, I need to write before the rest of the world gets in my head and starts mucking up my thoughts. And so I am best at writing first thing in the morning. And it, but it, it, it follows after some sort of um, practice or ritual or self-care that I, I try to do most mornings. And when you're, I, I love this idea that, you know, while it's quiet and you, you read a little bit to kind of put a little fuel in the tank or something, mm-hmm. uh, it, typically what are, what kind of stuff do you, do you read in that, in that time period before you start writing? Oh gosh, I am so, I am, I am a complete book hoarder and I will admit that I have come to grips <laughs> that I am a hoarder. I've asked people, don't tell me that you're reading something interesting because I can't be trusted not to put it in my Amazon cart. <laughs> and get it (laughs) and it'll just sit there but so I I read a lot of things at the same time and so at any given moment I'm simultaneously reading about five books at one time but I gave myself a little slack on that because um her president Obama also does that sort of thing so it must be like a thing with like (laughs) cool people oh yeah yep great Um, example but what am I reading now I'm reading a book the five invitations. So it's more sort of spiritually or not, not spiritual religious, but sort of um, thoughts around death and how we can learn from people who are um, in their last days, how we can learn to live a a fuller, more richer life. So there'd normally be something in that sort of um, Eastern thought, spiritual realm that I'll, I'll be reading and then I'm also reading um, a memoir, The Yellow House. I've got The Yellow House on my Kindle to to read because I want to I want to interview uh, her. Uh, it's, uh, I'm blanking on her first name, but her last name is Broom, though, right? Yeah, yeah Sarah. Sarah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. Totally. So I um, will read that, and then I'm reading um, just sort of in line with the work that I'm doing. I'm reading this book, The The, the Compton Cowboys. Oh, I read that. I had Walter on the podcast. It's a great oh, book. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Oh, I'll have to check that out there. You, you, you interviewed him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I had him on when the book came out, I don't know, probably a year, year and a half ago. Right, right, like, right. He's just a super cool guy. And a, what, what a book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just in the early stages of reading about the Compton Cowboys. So that just gives you a sort of an idea of the kind of stuff that I, I could be reading at any given moment. Oh, I love that. It's kind of, it's... It's a it's a very wide palette of stuff. So mm-hmm. depending on what kind of you know whatever mood you're in, or maybe what inspiration you want to draw from, it's just like okay, you know, I'm I'm feeling a little memoiristic right now. So here yeah. comes Sarah's book. You know, Walters is journalistic with a little mm-hmm. bit of personal story in there, and mm-hmm. you know it, that's that's really cool that you can just kind of draw on and pull on those strings, and eventually you know you finish one and you move on to the next. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So and I like that. I like that I I read for my pleasure, and if you know the books sort of. If I lose interest in it, I can always come back to it and pick up something else that feels better for the time. So, yeah, and I know some people that when they're when they're writing and they're reading something that might be a little, I don't know, too close thematically, if you will, mm-hmm. that sometimes there can be kind of a voice creep or you know mm-hmm. the the influence of what you're reading. Though you want that sort of uh, percolating underneath the thing you're writing, but sometimes it can almost um, put an umbrella over or have yeah. a. A too powerful an influence and do you do you have that issue at all or wrestle with that not really i, cause I sort of take in everything is like sort of data and and and, and so if it, it's so for example Compton cowboys is really close to uh, uh the topic that i'm writing working on a book proposal for and so um but i don't see it as, as sort of the writer taking over my head it's just like oh here's a really cool aspect of something that's being written and so it's just sort of more of data to consider as I sort of map my way forward. But I, I, you know, I live in my head, as I tell people, 
quite a bit. And so I'm, I'm pretty clear on my thoughts and what I think about things in the world and what my voice is. And maybe that's an advantage to, to coming truly into writing a little later in life is that I have had time to sort of do that internal work. So there's a little more clarity around it when I sit down to write things than maybe if I was sort of just developing as a, as a newish writer. Yeah, and coming to writing later in life, how have you processed that? Given that there's oftentimes a lot of um, a lot of competition, sometimes jealousy and resentment among among writers who have different paths in this. You know, you just kind of you look over your shoulder and you're like, "Oh man, like how are they doing that?" And uh, mm-hmm. well, I, I'm over here. And, and given that you started a little bit late, and you're looking, a lot of your you know peers and people are like. You know, who've been doing this for decades, you'd be like, oh man, they're, they're over there. Yeah. Like, how, how have you just managed to get a, you know, cultivate your own race? Yeah. This? Well, so I, I think it helps that I write for pleasure. It is completely, I write for my pleasure. I am not, mm. you know, your typical kind of journalist that you want to send on a beat, you know, unless it's a beat I want to be on, I don't want to go there. So I, I really write for things that are interesting to me that I am curious about. Um, and so that helps. And so when I see people doing great things, I, I'm inspired. I say, wow, this is the scope of what is possible for me. Um, I think it also helps too that while I do want to be paid equitably and compensated well for writing, I don't write to eat. You know, it, 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 yeah. my family is not being, we, if, if I don't write, if I don't get something commissioned in, in every month or whatever, it has no financial bearing over my family. And so I can be a little more relaxed and open with the work than if we needed it to survive. And so I think that has played a big role in it as well. Nice. And given that you're reading Compton Cowboys, uh, I, I, as I think for, you know, research for a book proposal that you just said, I have mm-hmm. to imagine that the book proposal is stemming from what you wrote for Pipe Wrench, that if we can soar. It, yeah. Is, am I, is that right? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. It's um, pulling back a little bit and sort of getting a bird's eye view of other things that were going on at the time and, and then sort of weaving it all together. And so it's, it's it, it promises to be the the great rabbit hole. I love rabbit holes where you just sort of go down this sort of research hole and you come back up and say, wait a minute, what was I looking for? <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. Yeah. And so, but you, it's all interesting, but you're like, wait a minute, what, what do I need this for? And so it promises to have a tremendous amount of rabbit holes, but hopefully will also be a very meaningful work as well. And so, yeah, that is, is exactly that sort of looking at different subcultures um, at, at the time in LA. Well, that's it. I think there might have been uh, an accidental pun in there when you said a bird's eye view, because it, a oh, lot yeah. of it has to do with the, <laughs> the totally. Birmingham roller pigeons. <laughs> uh, what, so, yeah, for, for people who haven't read this amazing piece that you did, uh, you know, just talk a little bit about it and, uh, you know, the, the crooks of it and, and maybe how you how you arrived at it. Yeah, sure. So maybe how I arrived at it might be a good place to start. Uh, it sure. was during the pandemic and I don't watch a lot of TV, but when I do, I will binge, you know, binge watch. So like watch several hours, you know, at a time. And I was just looking for something to sort of binge. And I, uh, was flipping around on Hulu and I saw this really cool picture of this guy with a pigeon on his head or bird. I didn't know it was a pigeon. It was a bird. I'm not even going <laughs> to pretend that I was that sophisticated and knowing it was a pigeon, but um, I thought, thought, wow, that's really cool. And so I looked at it. It was a documentary, uh, The Pigeon Kings. It explored the uh, Birming- the current Birmingham roller community in, in South Central LA right now. And so um, watched it. I was really uh, grateful for the documentary to have ha- for having been exposed to um, this new, uh, subculture, but it left me with more questions than answers. It just felt very unsettling in terms of really understanding what drew these men to the hobby and, and particularly just sort of, uh, rooting or sort of framing it a little bit more in the sort of sociocultural and historical things that were going on in South Central you know, during that time that most of them likely started. And so ended up reaching out to the the sort of uh, focal character of the documentary, Keith London, to just see if he would talk to me. I reached out via Twitter and he got back to me. 
And then from there, it just sort of spun off to connecting with other men um, who were Birmingham Roller Razors and, and, and competed with Birmingham Rollers. And what I found is what was really interesting were some of the older men who had been in it for decades and their stories um, that were really uh, rich and just sort of rooted and a lot rooted or anchored in what the community was experiencing at the time. And so that is where the story shifted to focus on the sort of earlier generations of Birmingham roller, black Birmingham roller men in South Central L.A. You know, what what excited you about the reporting and in, in the research uh, behind be, behind this particular piece? As you said, like some of these research rabbit holes, what, what were the rabbit holes that you got down when you were uh, researching and reporting this piece? Well, first, like what black men are flying pigeons? Like I'm from Hampton, Virginia, like suburban Virginia. And the thought of it was just so foreign to me. I was like, wow, this is a thing in the world. Like I would see it occasionally in movies, but I just thought it was more cinematic hype and not a real thing. And so that was really interesting to me. And then the the the, the men who were featured in the, the article, like Chuck and Paul and um, William and Jason, they were all such really fantastic uh, storytellers and just really, um, really sort of vivid and detailed. And you could, you could really tell they were reliving the experiences. And so that sort of drew me in as well. Also the genealogy piece of, um, of Cornell, I had to get an ancestry uh, dot com account and started pulling up like um, archival files and and draft cards and birth certificates and so there was just so many different holes to go down and understanding the the pigeon world and um, what makes a good Birmingham roller pigeon so I, I bought um, Bill Pensum's book and started reading on that so there was a lot of historical research a lot of technical research and a lot of genealogy research for this piece which was really fun. Is that uh, a part of the process that you find you're just very locked in and engaged in? You know, the research part? Yeah, I, I do. I like, I like learning new things and I like, I like research and getting a, the information. And then I find it, while it can be simultaneously frustrating and challenging, I also find it quite gratifying. Okay. Now that you have all this stuff, Shanna, how do you weave this into a comprehensive story that people will actually want to read, right? And so I think it's a combination of those pieces that are really appealing to me. But I do like the research part. It's probably maybe the, the, the academic in me, um, but I just find this research gratifying in ways that I, really, that I may not have felt all the time in the academic space because there's so many touch points with real people to be able to contextualize what you find. And, and, and that's really enjoyable and, 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 and helpful to move the piece forward. And a lot of people, you know, they, they love the research, but it can get overwhelming and get all this information. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's hard to get your head around, certainly to organize. Mm-hmm. So as someone who has a lot of academic re, uh, experience with research, and then this is more journalistic, you know, how have, what are the, the skills at your disposal? So you're doing this research, but you're organizing it in a way that you can properly synthesize it later for when you're ready to write about it. I'm a visual person. And so, so for the For the, if we can soar, I use Evernote to help me organize information, but I also have a cork board that is in my office where I can sort of map things out. I have a map of Los Angeles and different uh, pieces that are relevant to the story that I can sort of move around. I also had a timeline taped to my wall using index cards of, of key dates in, in sort of the history of what was going on in South Central um, LA at the time. And so I, I need to have those sort of visual pieces because it helps me it helps me to be able to put things in place. So while the content, the bulk of the content may be in something like Evernote or Scrivener, the, the, I, need, I need the anchors, the buckets, or the things that will sort of help me position that, that broader research visually available to me so on a board or a wall or something 
Yeah, and I, I I love in the in this piece too how you you come to it at the end where you where you write the the Cornells of the world are rarely recognized for their contributions outside of the communities that they serve. Soldiers in the fight against a structure they did not create. He was too loud, too street, too unstatus quo. The detriment of racism is that it's not. It not only binds people's opportunities, but blinds us from seeing the inherent humanity and value of those with black and brown skin, ensuring that black boys and men will continue to need spaces of refuge. And it just that soars. It comes to such a great crescendo at the end of the piece. And I was like, maybe you can speak to that, that need for need for refuge that this piece really fosters. Yeah. You know, I think 2020 is a it speaks pretty clear. I, I think uh to what the the ending of that piece is is trying to to sort of convey to the reader. I mean, there's just so much I can bring in data and research, but even there's sort of the lived experiences that we sort of faced. And it's not to say that black women are not also vulnerable to being overlooked, to being to to being denigrated or subjugated in society. It's sort of black people at large, but this piece focused really on black men. And we saw that. We, we had very uh, recurrent and invisible reminders of this from the George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, you know, even um, Christian Cooper. He was the 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 birder, the black birder in um, New York who uh, Amy Cooper called the the cops on and and sort of used her her race and gender and privilege to be able to paint a picture that is painted frequently about black men and boys in terms of them being violent and them being and, and them uh, being something that needs to be controlled or watched and so this is not something I think I think what the piece also hoped to do was to show that. While we have advanced quite a bit in this this country, or in narrowing it down to the South Central area, things haven't changed as much as we would like to think they have. That we are living in very comparable times in terms of the perceptions of Black people and how they are treated, particularly by those in positions in po- of power, and particularly by those who are in that power supposedly to be able to be there to protect all people but it's not it's not the experience of black and brown people in this in this country and as a result they will always we will always need spaces to be able to reconnect with ourselves not the self that the world says we are that we should be to be able to support and uplift one another and to be able to gain the energy that we need to live another day. And when I say living, I'm not talking about grand things, not even social justice movements, just to get up the next day and be able to, to have a certain optimism about the world that you live in, in spite of everything. It's it's such a brilliant point you make about you just trying to trying to live with the, you know, with a, a spark of optimism, given that the the power structures in place are all the all these quote unquote voting integrity laws that are trying to be put in place and namely in red states in the south where they're like all right you know that what happened 2020 happened we're going to make sure that things you know they, they just play in this very insidious long game which is just very dispiriting and I, I i don't know how you know we stay optimistic in the face of that but i yeah. guess it's just a matter of mobilizing yeah, and you know, what's interesting is that these things are always masqueraded as something else. You know, with the police mm-hmm. issue, it's protection. With the voting issue, it's it's about being fair. You know, but it's always there's always a cold word, and if you're not careful, you you miss the change of the cold word from one moment to the next. But it all boils down to the same sort of intention. And you know, there is there is organizing. There is getting behind putting in place a political representation that is more reflective of the the diversity as well diversity racial ethnic gender gender uh, sexuality but also the diversity of opinion that uh, is in the the US so not just having the status quo be the representatives for what happens in this country and then that requires political engagement you know the very thing that is being threatened right now the 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 ability to be able to decide who represents you and who speaks for you well absolutely and also doing what you've done with you know the piece you did for pipe wrench too of of bringing stories to light that 
uh, that are inspiring on you just inspiring great storytelling, but also just to, you know, to, to shine light in places where historically there haven't been a whole lot of the, that representation on, on the page or on the screen. So it's just all the more important to hear these things and be like, Oh, these are, this is inspiring. And this is going to make me want to, you know, you know, lift people up and and live in a in a world that where these stories can can find can find the page, find the light, find eyeballs because it's just so important to to hear and see these things. Yeah, totally. And and I think too with the piece for Pipe Wrench and in other pieces that do similar work is that while we are seeing sort of the visible examples of the problems that are sort of inbred in uh, the, the country and um, where we are today, I think I would, if I'm not a betting woman, but if I was to bet, I would be willing (laughs) to bet that uh, the greater majority of the U S population is, is probably pretty unclear about how we got here. Right. I think they think it's just something of today, but it isn't like this has been building for centuries. And so I, I think shining a light on the fact that this is something that we are sort of reaping based on what was sown, you know, many, many years ago, and that it is going to take a similar kind of concerted effort uh, in, in, in trying to undo it. It's not an overnight thing, but there needs to be an awareness that we, are, that's the nature when people say things are systemic, right? That they have been hard baked into the way that this country operates. And so to undo that is going to take time, but we have to recognize historically how we got there in hopes that we don't repeat that history. Oh, absolutely right. And I think there's um there there's a I think a lot of people probably want to just say, "Oh, those those old old racists racists are just they're just going to die and then once they mm-hmm. die, we can sort of plant new ground above it and live in uh, uh live in a new day." But the fact of the matter is, they're just they're they don't die. It, it like you said, it's hard baked. It's systemic. It's almost genetic. Yeah. And and it, it it will never go away unless you kind of break down those structures and rebuild systems. Because but to hope that it's just going to die away, I'm sorry. There are a lot of very young and powerful racist politicians in Congress today that replaced the Strom Thurmonds of mm-hmm. the world. They're not going anywhere. Absolutely. And guess what, folks? Most of the time, racist, homophobic, xenophobic people raise racist, homophobic, homophobic, xenophobic children. But what happens is they learn to present this part of themselves differently, you know, as the times morph, but the core value is still the same. So this stuff isn't disappearing uh, overnight, you know, that it, it is something that is hard baked and we have to address and call it out. I've been loving examples of people calling it out more for what it is um, and, and giving it a name and giving voice to it versus ignoring it and pretending that it's going to go away because it hasn't and it won't unless there is something that is done to 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 change it. And when you were writing uh, the, the piece for Piper Wrench, I imagine you were working with Michelle. Um, you know, what were some of the, the dialogues that you were having, editor to writer, as you were composing this piece and trying to make it the best that, that it could possibly be? So first, I want to start off by saying Michelle is awesome. I think she is by far the best editorial experience I have had in my very young, nascent writing career. She has ruined it for probably every other <laughs> editor that I will work <laughs> with because the bar is so dang high in terms of Really, she came into it as saying, I am, a, I am in service of you in this piece, and I am here to help you birth this baby. She's like a, like a writing doula almost. She was there to help me <laughs> birth this baby in any way that was meaningful. If it meant getting you know, towels, cold compresses, or whatever, she was really willing to do it. And so it was helpful because I gave an initial iteration of the first draft and it was totally not the right direction. Um, But she didn't say that. She said, look, you just need to keep writing. You need to keep writing your way through it. You need to keep getting more words on the page and it's going to come together. And I think being given that space, that sort of non-judgmental space to do that, in fact, really did help me come into my own with this piece more and figure out where different parts needed to go. And so she sort of pushed 
she sort of pushed me to continue to write more and to, to, to think through different aspects a little bit more. She also encouraged me to be more voicey. She wanted to mm. see more of me in the piece. Um, I can be very, I'm very good at writing about uh, the stories of others and, and, and very careful sometimes about inserting my own opinions or um, uh, sort of voice too directly, but she encouraged that, which was helpful for me to know that there is a space for me to write about others and bring my voice more prominently into pieces. And that if this is something that pipe wrench value, then, then likely other publications do or will too. Yeah, and I like what you what you're getting at is this kind of working through the rewrites and the revision process of uh, of a draft and just pushing it through and developing it and developing it. And uh, in your TEDx talk about dealing with unkindness about this uh, horrible experience you had, a horrible culmination to a great what was a great experience at the Grand Grand Canyon, but which soured it. This I this uh this notion um of writing through the anger of what you and your family experience. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that piece um, and what that experience was like, but then how you wrote your way through it to ultimately get to where you got for this long reads piece. Yeah. That, so that was, I, that was one of my first long form pieces that I wrote for long reads, which was also a really great partner in helping me develop my writing it was about this experience, you know, like my family and I, we planned this great vacation. I just finished my, my PhD and we... I'm going to punch in real quick, just real quick right here. So what we're referring to here is the, this piece that Shanna wrote for a long reads. She was on a bus and the Grand Canyon and the bus driver literally asked Shanna and her family to move to the back of the bus. Okay, so that, that should give you all the context you need. Okay, so back to back to Shanna. We had a great vacation in Arizona. We went to tour the state a little bit. And it was, except for this one experience, a really great vacation. Arizona was beautiful. We loved Sedona. And the the Grand Canyon was, was phenomenal. But we encountered a bus driver who really was racist and discriminatory towards us. And, and so it... it, it, it cast a bit of a shadow over our trip and really caused my husband and I to have discussions with our children that we just didn't plan to have to have on a vacation that we had paid to fly across the, the U.S. for. And I was angry. I was angry for a long time. I, for me, initially, ang being angry um, propels me towards action. What can I do about it? And so I, I wrote formal complaints to the Grand Canyon, to uh, the bus company that actually manages the buses for the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon does not manage them directly. Made phone calls and 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 um, looked for other avenues to make sure that this situation was corrected and that this bus driver was reprimanded or disciplined as they saw fit. And in both cases, both the Grand Canyon and the bus management company manage things correctly. They were empathetic. They disciplined the bus driver. They wrote formal letters of apology. You know, it, it was fine after that, but I was still angry that this happened to us. And so I, I wrote several iterations of that essay and from different angles. Um, and each time I wrote it, it, it got, I was able to soften up to the experience and be vulnerable to my own uh, pain and sadness about what had happened. And it got better the more I was able to sort of drop into that space of, of vulnerability and not just sort of hover above it with the anger. Yeah. And, and you talk about how, you know, there's a, a guardedness that you've that you've walked through the world with. And when you were at the Grand Canyon, you're like, I need to break this, break this wall down so you can take in the wonder. And it was just like in that moment of vulnerability is just when this, mm -hmm. when this woman, you know, trespassed on that after having experienced this beautiful hike with your, with your whole family and the wonder of one of the great natural wonders of the world. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, having let that garden this down is when the, you know, when this happens. Right. So it's just like, and you talk about that so beautifully in your, in your talk. Yeah, totally. It was almost like, 
you know, you do the one thing that you're most scared of doing and then you get yeah. sucker punched. It's like, oh, man, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't want to do that anymore. That hurts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so it, it did. It sucked. I was like, man, because I my my general disposition in the past has been to be more guarded, reserved, on the lookout for the next shoe to drop so that I'm ready for it with a one-two punch before it, it sort of happens to me. But in this one experience, I sort of let myself be in the moment and not have to be, you know, Black female Shanna looking, scanning her environment for threats, right? And so, and then this happens. And, and I think part of it too was that I was allowing this experience to take away the joy of other experiences after it had happened. I was much more guarded after that for, for a while. And I was like, wait a minute, this lady, this bus driver does not get to have that kind of power over your life, Shanna. Like she is not worth it. And I realized how much power I was giving over to the experience and how I could continue that way. And chances are, if it happened again, I would be ready. But how much would I have lost in the interim of one unfortunate experience to the next. And so I think that was really what propelled me to try to find some way to heal uh, from it so that I could move on and enjoy my life. Yeah. And you talk about how, you know, there's, there's a balance of protecting yourself from unkindness without causing self harm or even like bad, you know, experiences in that, in that garden. So there is a there's a guarded vulnerability spectrum and you talk about that. I was wondering maybe if you can, I don't know, maybe elaborate on that about, you know, striking that balance. Yeah. Um, it's hard. It's, it's a daily task, um, or reminder or practice is probably a better word of, of how to strike that balance. Um, I have learned to lean into my intuition a lot more when you walk into a space or a scene or you meet people and it just feels off. It probably is, you know, and so not pushing those experiences only to prove what my intuition was telling me in the first place. And so that has been helpful. And I also take people at face value. I, you know, the, there's it, when people show me how they are, you know, I, rather than wishing they were different or hoping or, or believing that my hope can hope them into a different state of being, I take them for, for how they are and, and make a decision if I want to continue to engage with them, be it personally or professionally. And so that has been really helpful in striking the balance in that I don't have to do as much work because it, it filters out those, those, those bad interpersonal interactions before they happen. And, and giving myself grace when I'm when I make a wrong call, you know, not to beat myself up about it too much, uh, but to learn from it and to try to develop a better habit of standing in my own power. I think that was what really bothered me about the Grand Canyon situation is that I didn't feel as though I stood in my own power enough in that situation. Like there was more to be said. There was more that could have been done. There was more that I shouldn't have done you know, when the bus driver made the request and it just felt like I gave my power away in that situation. So I'm learning to stand more in that power more regularly and to feel okay with it feeling uncomfortable as long as I sort of have a consistency around it. Yeah. And you also talk about, you know, releasing recording and uh, the respite mm -hmm. component of you know, uh, of dealing with an experience of, you know, it could be of that nature or, or something else. And, you know, how important has that practice been for you to, to process, you know, process events or, you know, whether they be you know, negative or positive? Yeah. And uh, immensely um, uh, uh, helpful for me, you know, the release, recount and, and take respite. The, you know, the releasing is, I largely attribute to my sort of my meditation practice, being able to sort of bring myself back to the present moment. Because when I'm not releasing, I'm ruminating. When, when I'm caught in those moments, what I found is that I'm sort of stuck in that past experience, ruminating about it. But if I can bring myself into the present moment and, and, and focus on all that is good and is well, it is, been, it is helpful. And it also, with the meditation practice, it gives you a space to, 
to to intentionally uh, focus on past experiences and the anger and the frustration and all the the ugly feelings that you feel around it and just sort of sitting with that. And so it, it, it sort of serves both purposes. And so it's been immensely helpful for me. Recounting is my writing and speaking. It is how I process the world. I'm much more of an internal person, but being able to get out of my head and write and speak about things has really been helpful for for me and moving beyond things that happen to me directly or things that I see in the world that I'm angry or upset about. And then respite. I'm, I'm embracing the respite more and more formally by, you know, uh, uh, scheduling time for, for rest, scheduling time for vacation, scheduling time to check out. I, I'm trying to be more intentional about integrating that in my life than I have been in the past. And building communities that support that, you know, through friends or connections or other sort of spaces that are supportive of that need for respite. Now tell me a little bit about your, your Instagram and the, and the, your, the, and the homesteading you do. And, uh... You've done your research. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, right. I, I am a suburban homesteader. Um, interesting story about that. It actually started homesteading um, uh, after I think my third year in my doctoral program because I was a hot mess. I was mentally and physically just <laughs> a mess. And I was like, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> I was doing a full time <laughs> doctoral program. I had three kids at the time. You know, I was also working full time and I was just a mess. And so I need to shake things up. And a friend suggested that we join a community garden. And keep in mind, I hated dirt up until that point. I didn't want to touch it. I didn't want to be <laughs> around it. Despite the fact that I was an agroforestry volunteer in Peace Corps, I was not into gardening in any way. But Decided to do it around 2014 and just fell in love with it. Drug my kids and my husband into it and said, this will be great family time. I was really looking for partners in misery because I thought it was going to (laughs) suck. But we loved it and we have been doing it ever since. We expanded. We cultivate in two community gardens and a, a, a large portion of our residents and our Instagram page, Black Suburban Homestead, is, is sort of sharing that experience. And, and it's an effort to, to increase representation in this homesteading space. It is typically um, considered to be a very, very white space. So you don't see a lot of racial and ethnic diversity in people who consider themselves to be homesteaders. And, and we love it. It's been a great community where we share what we know and people share what they know. If we have questions, people are more than willing to provide uh, advice or suggestions. It's just been a real community in that space and something that we have really liked a lot more than we thought we would have when we started the the page. Yeah. It's so important to have those things that are like um, so completely divorced from, you know, writing or creativity, Mm -hmm. but, but it informs it also at the same time, you know, like it's just, I, I love, I love hearing you talk about it like that. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it's a great way to to reflect and commune and, and, and just sort of think and not think and just be at the same time. And so it's really offers a lot of great advantages or great compliments to the work that I do. And so I really enjoy it and, and you get food from it. I mean, who, who doesn't like food? (laughs) Oh, exactly. Yeah, like you're quite literally giving people nourishment. Like if you, you're made for your family and if you have a surplus, you're like, here's some tomatoes. Yeah, These are absolutely, great. Absolutely. Absolutely. My, my thing that I, my sort of my jam literally and figuratively is this spicy tomato jam that I make. And that's what I give to people and they, they like it. It's like, like ketchup with a kick. And so Whoa. that's my thing too. I'm also a first generation canner. So I learned, I taught myself how to can. And so Again, like learning new things, doing different things. That's kind of always sort of been my thing, I guess. Going to be an Iron Man. You're 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 can you're canning. You're doing all these things. This is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Life is <laughs> full of so many possibilities. I, I truly do believe that. Excellent. Well, as I, I like to bring this airliner down by asking uh, guests for recommendations of, of some kind. And um, I, I think I primed the pump with you with this a, a few emails ago, but it, if I did, great. Uh, if not, um, 
if I catch you flat footed, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but but I but I always like to ask for a recommendation for for the listeners out there from the guests. So uh, I, if you if you've got one, I'd love to hear it. Okay, and anything, right? It doesn't have to be like writing related, right? Correct. It could be anything. I always say that it could be, could be a book, it could be a brand of coffee or a new pair of socks. It's a, it could be anything. I am going to suggest my new sort of thing that I'm vibing off of right now is mushroom tea. Okay, like the Four Sigmatic stuff? Well, the one I have, it is a lion's mane blend, but there's so many mm. t- uh, different varieties. I won't say that I I am loyal to one particular variety, but there are lots of different varieties out there, but just drinking more mushrooms. They have really great uh, health and beneficial properties for your mood, for your digestion, and it's just a nice alternative sometimes to coffee and just regular tea. And so I've really been enjoying that with a little bit of oat milk. And that's sort of my jam right now. Fantastic. Mushroom tea. I love it. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, well, Shanna, this was so great to talk to you about about the work you're doing and uh, and all, uh, all the other things you've got going on on the side. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast and uh, talking shop. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. This was this was fun for me, too. Um, I didn't know what to expect, but it was great. It was, it was a great conversation and it sort of covered a wide array of topics. So thank you. Right. Thanks to Shanna for the time and to Michelle Weber of Pipe Wrench Magazine for putting us in touch. Shanna is at Shanna B-T-I on on Twitter and Black underscore Suburban underscore Homestead on Instagram. Great follows. Hey, thanks to West Virginia Wesleyan College's creative writing program, MFA, for the support and Hippocamp 2021 We did it. We did it again. Another year. Thanks, Hippocamp. It's been real. It's happening right now, depending on when you listen to this. So I teased out in the intro that the problem I have with advice culture, if you will, if you want to call it a problem, is uh, that you occasionally hear these podcasts, many of which I enjoy, uh, some to some extent, deep questions with Cal Newport, even though that one can get a little bit grating. Um, Even the Q&A part of Seth Godin's Akimbo, uh, that one's not nearly as grating. Uh, listeners, ask questions. You know, I, I've asked a question. I've actually had a question run on the Akimbo one, too. Uh, many of them, I fear, are are looking for the panacea, that cure-all answer to their woes. And by turning to a, quote, expert, and I'm presuming that they're trying to do an end-around or shortcut to get where they want to go. And I understand this because I, I think on some level I was once like that frustrated that the tires were just spinning and spinning and spinning. It's like, geez, I need some sort of a key to unlock this door. And Or maybe they're looking for hacks. I really hate hacks and life hacks and hack culture that's been ushered in by the tech bros, uh, namely uh, Tim Ferriss at the spearhead of that. There's no substitute for trial and error, if you ask me, and, and, and finding out what works for you. You, know, you go to the shoe store, you try on a whole bunch of shoes, and that's the whole point. See what fits. But at the same time, I understand that if you're trying to find answers uh, and you're not looking for shortcuts, and you might hope to find a, a headlamp through the dark path that you're on. I can see value in both, but I, I can't seem to shake this idea of that always seeking advice is also a crafty way to hide and avoid the work. You know, if you find another podcast to listen to or another book to read or another YouTube video to get inspired, what you're really doing is kind of avoiding the slog and the grind it takes to do creative work. Now, there's a balance, of course, but I, I think there's there are definitely traps to this. Uh, if I listen to just one more one more podcast, one more interview, that's going to be the one that I'm, that, that'll give me the kick in the butt I really need. I'm no different. I've asked questions and advice in an effort to grease the skids of my own train tracks. And like I said, there's a balance. If you're really stuck, then maybe it's time to seek answers from people who have been there. Not as a shortcut, but because you're you're trying to navigate, I don't know, Alabama with a Massachusetts map. You know, you just you're it's not lining up. But there are some out there who have to know that every little tool, trick, tip and hack that all you're doing at this point is spinning your wheels, trying to apply someone else's hard-won recipe 
to your own life, hoping it'll blast you off into the stratosphere. Now, if you have questions of that, I, that maybe I can answer, ask away. But if you're looking for the capital A answers, well, I don't think anybody has them. And you're better off taking out your own machete, blazing your own path, and consulting Mr. Trial and Mrs. Error, or the other way around. The thing is, next week I might have an entirely different take on this, but my main point is not to get too lost in seeking advice. As far as I can tell, the only way through it is through it, man. And that's not particularly wise um, advice, but the shoe fits for the moment. So stay wild, CNFers, and if you can do, interview. See ya!